today we are going to be talking about the faction focus for Tyranids. We are going to be talking about faction rules, synapse, shadow in the warp, gene stealer data cards, the swarm lord, the rupture cannon and a lot more. If you enjoyed the content, consider leaving a thumbs up and subscribing, as well as checking the links down in the description below if you want to follow me over on Twitter or Twitch, or if you want to join our little community over on Discord. My name is Eplash, and this is Empire of War Games. So a couple of information before we get into the meat of the video, which is the Tyranids, obviously. In case you missed it, we are going to get one faction focus video every weekday of the week until all of the factions are covered. At least that is what a Facebook comment from GW has said. And that seems to be also kind of supported by the very bottom of the article, which says faction focus next up chaos space Marines. And that seems to be going up tomorrow. So expect another video tomorrow as well. But today we are going to be talking about the Tyranids and all of the different faction rules, a couple of data cards, weapons and stratagems. So when we look at the overview, GW is just giving us a couple of ideas on what to expect from the article and nothing like what we've seen for the Space Marines where they hinted at Gravis getting an additional point of toughness or so on. That is not the case here in the Tyranid article. But what we are getting is the Synapse rule, which is not to be confused with the rules that we've already seen for the invasion fleet, which is hyper adaptions. So the synapse rule reads the following. If your army faction is Tyranids, while a Tyranids unit from your army is within six inches of one or more synapse models from your army, that unit is said to be within synapse range of your army. Each time a Tyranid unit from your army takes a battle shock test, if it is within synapse range of your army, take that test on a 3d6 instead of a 2d6. Now we have it. So the synapse rule is actually a lot more reliability when it comes to your Battleshock tests. In my opinion, failing a Battleshock test on a 3d6 is highly unlikely. Um, rolling anything below a 7, I think, is a 10% chance. And rolling a 7 or higher on 3d6 is like 90%. So yeah, that is a huge buff. The one thing you need to keep in mind is that 6 inches is not a lot and you need to be within those 6 inches. So this is more Age of Sigma style here again. So yeah, it is a very strong rule. It adds a lot to the reliability of your Battleshock tests. I think with 3d6 you are barely going to fail depending on how bad the uh, uh, Battleshock tests or uh, leadership stats are going to be on some units. But if Termagants are anything to go by, you'll likely never be losing or failing those Battleshock tests. And yeah, it's just a cool probability buff if you're able to stay within those six inches of a synapse creature. Now, while the synapse rule is still fairly similar to what we've seen in ninth edition, where staying within synapse range severely buffs your leadership score and makes it very difficult for you to fail it. Uh, once you take out those synapse units, it gets more and more difficult to maintain that. And that is even more pronounced here. So that is kind of a strength and a weakness at the same time. But the Shadow and the Warp ability has changed quite significantly. In 9th edition, it was something along the lines of screw cycles. And now it is something completely different and a lot more interesting. So let's go into it. It reads, if your army faction is Tyranids, once per battle, in either player's command phase, if one or more units from your army with this ability are on the battlefield, you can unleash the Shadow in the Warp. When you do, each enemy unit on the battlefield must take a battle shock test. So the first impression on this ability for most is that this is very, very strong. My first impression of this ability is that it is very strong against certain factions, while it is kind of useless against others. There are, I hope, not going to be any factions that are completely immune to battle shock tests. I think there's going to be a generic stratagem that is going to allow you to pass your battle shock tests or leadership tests. And I think there are going to be a lot of factions that are fairly strong with high leadership values like Necrons, or maybe factions or sub-factions that get a strong boost for their leadership, like for example maybe Dark Angels. But generally speaking, this seems to be very strong against certain factions like Orcs or Tau or generally low leadership armies, while it is quite bad against forces like Necrons, as I said, or sub-factions like the Dark Angels, which previously had very strong uh, leadership scores or were flat out immune against anything that had anything to do with leadership. So Shadow and the Warp remains to be seen in my book. 
And by that, I mean that we have to wait and see whether it is going to be effective across the board or whether this is going to have clear strengths and weaknesses against certain factions or not. Furthermore, what we don't quite know yet is whether OC0 units can hold objectives, not contest them, but rather if they are OC0 and they're alone on an objective, are they still holding it? I personally don't think so, but that is a critical information that we are missing currently. Furthermore, um, yeah, as I said, is there a generic stratagem for auto-passing Battleshock? That would be important to know. And um, if you're using this ability, it triggers during the command phase. So if you're triggering it during the command phase of your opponent, um, remember that scoring happens at the end of the command phase. So you can cost your opponent, if OC0 doesn't score any points, a lot of victory points at that point. So it is probably the best thing to trigger um, whenever your opponent is on a lot of objectives and during their command phase, because if you manage to trigger Battleshock, it is going to be a lot of victory points that your opponent is going to be losing. Just something to keep in mind. Another quick reminder regarding Battleshock is that Battleshock stays around for one turn. And if your unit is below half strength or half wounds, your unit is going to have to recheck Battleshock tests. But until then, a Shadow of the Warp just triggers once, and that is it for one turn. And you are going to have to reapply it later on via other abilities, or via just reducing your opponent's units by half, or their wound score by half. So yeah, that is another thing that is good to know in case you forgot. So yeah, the army-wide rules for now are pretty mixed in my opinion. Uh, the sign-ups rule can be very strong, but it's quite limiting when it comes to the range, and it has the same downsides of... If you lose Synapse creatures, you are going to be in trouble. While the Shadow and the Warp ability or Army White Rule is a mixed bag, in my opinion, and we need a lot more critical information on OC0, on objective holding, and on other factions' leadership scores and whether leadership immunity or Battleshock immunity exists within the rule set. I hope it doesn't, but you never know. Now, when it comes to the unit spotlight, we have the Gene Stealers first, and these guys are interesting. We are talking about movement 8, toughness 4, a save of 5 plus, 2 wounds, so an additional wound here for them, leadership of 7 plus, which is not bad at all actually, um, an OC of 1, and yeah, that is a generally very, very decent uh, stat line. As I said, the leadership of 7 kind of threw me off because it's really good. You are going to succeed on a leadership role or battleshock role uh, almost 60% of the time. So 58% of the time. Pretty good. Um, as I said, an additional wound for our Gene Stealers here, which is also very strong. Um, their weapons, the Gene Stealer Claws and Talents, are 4 attacks, which is quite a lot. Weapon skill 2, strength 4, AP minus 2, and damage 1. Uh, if I remember correctly, we are losing a little bit of AP here, but we are gaining additional attacks. If I'm not completely mistaken, but either way, the... The sheer number of attacks paired with the additional abilities they have on the right hand side of the data card is going to lead to a lot of reliability when it comes to delivering those attacks. So let's look at the abilities tab next. We have a core ability that says Scouts 8, which is basically a pre-game move of 8 inches, which is quite a lot. Um, we are getting more and more daring when it comes to the range of kind of pre-game move abilities and kind of scout abilities and so on. But it fits the Gene Stealer, so it's fine. Uh, the faction ability is Synapse, as always. But then it has the ability Vanguard Predator. Each time a model in this unit makes an attack, reroll the wound roll of 1. If the target is within range of an objective marker, you can reroll the wound roll instead. Now, a lot of people were already salty that we are getting additional rerolls and that rerolls should have been a little bit rarer. But keep in mind that rerolls here are only for one singular unit. And it's not kind of a Death Star Ball of Doom with auras applying to six units separately. That is just something to keep in mind. Furthermore, Vanguard Predator, uh, Predator is just there for reliability's sake. And while Gene Stealers only have OC1 regularly, keep in mind that we are moving, or it's, at least it seems that way, that we are moving into a Hero Hammer kind of scenario with Warhammer 40,000 at the moment. And I absolutely see the Brute Lord adding additional OC to Gene Stealers. That would make sense for the Gene Stealer cults as well as the regular Tyranids. So um, expect Gene Stealers to have ways to add or increase their OC value. 
So yeah, you, I, I suspect that you're going to make a lot of use of the Vanguard Predator rule and get the full reroll to wounds, but that remains to be seen. Now, when it comes to their durability, they have received an additional wound, but they have lost their ability of getting a 4-up invulnerable save in melee. Instead, their durability comes from a flat-out invulnerable save of 5+, plus against everything, which is an upside and a downside at the same time, but I think considering they have also received an additional wound, I see their durability as a net positive and as really good. So an invulnerable save of 5 plus in melee and against range attacks with an additional wound is great in my opinion. But the only downside about this data sheet is really uh, that the gene stealers have no new models and the old ones really don't look that great. That is really the only downside I can see here. You could argue that their melee weapons are not as great as they used to be, but I think with the volume of attacks, it kind of offsets that and Vanguard Predator um, adds another kind of layer of lethality to their attacks. I think Gene Stealers are absolutely fine and there's nothing to complain about here. Now, when we are talking about complaining about units though, there is the Swarm Lord. So let's talk about this guy. This guy has a movement of 8, toughness of 10, a save of 2+, plus, 10 wounds, a leadership of 7, and an OC of 3. Now, the one important thing that I've seen a lot across Reddit is that people are comparing the Swarm Lord for some unexplicable reason to Rubuti Gilliman. I understand that the Swarm Lord is an important entity within the Turinid Hive Mind, but comparing the Swarm Lord without any further context, like points for example, with Rubuti Gilliman is a bad idea and you shouldn't do it. Just something to keep in mind. When we look at the weapons, we have a Synaptic Pulse, which is a Psychic Torrent ability, uh, which has D6 plus 3 attacks at an 18-inch range. You don't need a Ballistic skill because of the Torrent ability, you hit automatically. It is Strength 5, AP-1 damage 2. Now, while the Synaptic Pulse is a cool Flamer weapon that has a lot of attacks um, and a lot of reliability when it comes to the number of attacks, the one thing that is clearly kind of missing here is the Psychic Flavor of the Swarm Lord and of the Tyranids. Tyranids previously had a lot more psychic flavor, and yeah, the Synaptic Pulse, while being cool and being a psychic attack, um, all in all, is still a cool thing, but the abilities tab doesn't make up for the loss of all the cool psychic abilities that a Swarm Lord could possibly have. So here is still hoping that psychic units get to choose at least one ability additionally from their codex or from their index. Next up are the Bone Sabers, which were also quite controversial. These are twin link melee weapons with 8 attacks, weapon skill of 2+, plus, strength 9, AP-2, damage 3. Now a lot of people were quite angry about the Swarm Lord having 4 swords, while Gilliman has 1, and Gilliman still has 6 attacks. It, now admittedly Gilliman doesn't have twin linked, so he has no rerolls to wounds, but his weapon is generally better and a lot more attacks. I can understand that, but I expect the Swarm Lord to cost about half as much as Gilliman, to be completely honest. So uh, take it all with a grain of salt for now. Um, if the Swarm Lord is going to be quite expensive, then I'm going to be able to understand uh, why you're salty. But for now, let's wait it out and let's see the points cost. I agree that the Bond Savers are nothing super special, but I think they are great against light vehicles, heavy infantry, and even light infantry with 8 attacks. But you're usually going to try and target something like Space Marines or Rhinos or heavier infantry. It is not ideal against kind of a sea of Guardsmen or anything. Now, when we look at the right hand side on the abilities tab, um, your Swarm Lord can apparently blow up in a D3 Mortal Wound explosion. Um, it is a leader choice, which means it can get attached to additional units. Um, if you remember correctly, Robuti Gilliman did not have that ability. Uh, Robuti Gilliman is considered on his own, but as soon as he is within the range of a couple of units, he gets a lone operative ability which protects him. But while the Swarm Lord is an epic hero, he still has the leader ability. So that is just something curious to keep in mind. Furthermore, he has the Shadow and the Warp ability and the Synapse ability. So this is a unit that enables you to use the Shadow and the Warp ability. If this guy is your only unit with the Shadow and the Warp ability and he dies, you lose access to that army-wide rule and you cannot use it anymore. Just something to keep in mind if you want to keep your Shadow and the Warp uh, for the later stages of the game. At that point, you need to be very cautious with these units and try not to lose them. Then we have Hive Commander. At the start of your command phase, if this model is on the battlefield, you gain 1 CP. 
this is an underrated ability. Uh, GW said that CP are going to go down for this edition yet again. And CP are going to get very sparse and it's going to be very difficult to get additional CP. So I think this is a very, very strong ability. And the same applies to Malign Presence. Once per battle, after your opponent uses a stratagem, if this model was your warlord and is on the battlefield, it can use this ability. If it does, until the end of the battle, increase that stratagem's cost to your opponent by one. This can be incredibly strong, especially if there is something like transhuman physiology again, or just evergreen stratagems. This is going to be way better against factions and detachments that have strong stratagems, but even if they don't, just kind of uh, manipulating their command reroll or something is still a decent way to go about screwing your opponent over. So Malign Presence can be very, very strong against armies that have that one stratagem that usually carries them because you can effectively shut it down if we are getting very, very few uh, command points per game. And last but not least, we have the Domination of the Hive Mind. It reads, while a friendly Tyranids unit is within 9 inches of this model, that unit is within your army's synapse range. So this one increases the synapse range by 3 inches. Very useful because, as I said, you need to stay within that radius and you it's not enough to just touch that aura anymore because you need to be within it is age of sigmar style and yeah it is any range increase at that point is very very valuable and three additional inches is quite a lot and last but not least we obviously have a far up and vulnerable save as is usual for stronger named characters like the swarm lord here uh, when it comes to the keywords there's a lot to look at here we have the epic hero um Keyword, we have the Great Devourer, which is probably just going to be kind of the base keyword for the Tyranids or to enable some of their army wide rules. Synapse and so on is kind of self explanatory. So, yeah, the Swarm Lord, all in all, not the best unit, but comparing him to Rubut de Gilliman is not the play. Let's wait out and see how many points this guy is going to be costing. I expect. If this guy is going to be costing right around half of Rubuti Gilliman or around that plus minus a few points, I think he's definitely going to be worth it. But comparing him one to one with Gilliman is just not the play. Next up, we are moving over to the weapon spotlight, which is going to be fairly quick. It is the Rupture Cannon, which is a heavy weapon at 48 inches of range, two attacks, ballistic scale of 3 plus, strength 18, AP minus 4, damage 2d6. Okay, there's a little bit to unpack here. You're getting two attacks at Ballistic Skill 3. Usually, if your unit is not going to move, it's going to be Ballistic Skill 2+, plus, so very reliable. Strength 18 means you're going to be wounding pretty much anything and everything on at least a 3+, plus, um, usually on a 2+. plus. If it's something like a Repulsor Executioner or a heavier vehicle, you're going to be wounding on 3+, plus, which is absolutely fine. AP-4 means nothing is going to have a save, unless, it's, unless it has an invulnerable save. And damage to d6, while it is not as good as the Repulsor Executioner's Heavy Laser Destroyer's 1d6 plus 4 damage, 2d6 is still quite nice because you are going to roll an average of 7 damage 60% of the time. Still very decent. In case you're worried about rolling Snake Eyes, so basically 2 damage, the percentage chance here is right around 3%. So very unlikely. And the same likelihood then again applies logically for 12 damage. It is still a bell curve for 2d6. That is why I really like the 2d6 damage die, and I think it's still a very, very decent weapon that is probably going to reliably deal 14 damage to something every turn. Very strong if you ask me. And last but not least is the Stratagem Spotlight. It is Endless Swarm for the Invasion Fleet, and it is a strategic ploy stratagem. For 1 CP, it reads when your command phase target two endless multitude units from your army, like Termagants for example, that are within synapse range of your army or one other endless multitude unit from your army. Effect up to D3 plus 3 destroyed models are returned to each of the selected units. That means that swarm armies are getting support, which is great. I hope swarm armies are going to be viable again. And yeah, having the ability to on average resurrect 10 Tyranid models is great. Depending on how many points you are going to be paying for a termagant, they can easily rack up to 60 points or maybe even 100 points depending on their cost. So keep an eye on this one because this one seems very strong. And as I said, I hope that units like termagants, hormagants, gargoyles and so on are going to get further support via stratagems, via cool leader choices and so on. 
So yeah, Ender Swarm is in my opinion a very positive stratagem and a very strong one indeed. And that is it for the Tyranid Spotlight. It is a mixed bag in my opinion. Um, a little bit of cool stuff. Um, the Synapse Rule and the Shadow of the Warp Rule have their upsides and have their downsides, but we need a little bit more information on these. I think the Gene Slayers are a net positive in all regards, and I really like their new rules, and they're kind of easier to digest kind of defensive stats, and that they are not just going to get shot down and destroyed immediately, which is nice. The Swarm Lord is a little bit of a problem in my opinion, but as I said, it depends on the points. If he's going to be cheap, then that's fine. If he's going to be as expensive as, say, Robuto Gilliman, then that model is quite bad. But keep in mind that Hive Commander and Malign Presence, so the command point altering abilities, can be valued very, very highly if you are only talking about 3 CP or maybe 2 CP even for a 2000 points game with 1 CP per turn or something. If CP are very, very scarce, this ability gets exponentially more valuable. So as, as with almost everything in this article, we are missing critical information here. But for now, I would say that the Swarm Lord is quite bad. The Rupture Cannon is great, and the Stratagem Spotlight for Endless Swarm was also great. So all in all, it is a net positive, but the Swarm Lord leaves a little bit of a bitter aftertaste. If you have any opinions on any of these models, especially the Swarm Lord, or um, any of the weapons, the stratagems, the rules, let me know in the comments below. If I've missed anything, point it out and I'll gladly reread rules and kind of correct myself. And yeah, I hope this was an insightful video and I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.